we're finally going to get to talk about shapes in space here. In 11.5, we talk about fairly boring shapes, lines and cones. We'll start off with simple. And then the next section, we'll talk about more kinds of surfaces, and we'll kind of just keep building from there. But if we start off with the simple shapes of line and plane, we'll see they show up a lot later on. But again, they're also shapes that we know how to picture, know how to work with them. Instead of trying to think about a whole new bunch of systems and shapes, work with stuff we know. However, in three dimensions, lines are a bit more complicated. I mean, lines in two dimensions. So the first thing I have in the notes here. What do we know about lines in a 2D system? What information do we need in order to graph a line on a regular x, y plane? Slope. Yeah, well, usually we'll have a point and we'll have slope. Now, if we don't have slope, we could be given two points to find slope. But for the most part, we have slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. We need to have a slope and we need to have a point. And then we know how to make lines with that. We have our good old y equals mx plus b. Okay. But this doesn't work in 3D because in 3D, we don't just have slope. We've got this direction that it can go off in a bunch of different directions. And so vectors are going to have to kind of replace that concept of slope there. Um, but basically, in 3D, we're going to need very similar pieces of information. We're still going to need a point. Okay, no matter what, if you've got some line, you've got to force it to go through some point. But instead of just saying slope, we need to account for all the different directions that could have there. So we'll just say slope and direction. And there's a lot of different ways you can find that direction. We might be told the vector we want to go in the direction of. We might be told some points that we want it to go through, much like we did above there. And we'll see some other variations as we kind of map this, but we need some kind of direction here. So if we try to match up the new things in Calc 3 with things we know previously math, hopefully that kind of helps us to be able to remember here. I left a lot more space and need on this one. We're not going to fill all that in. Okay, but basically this equation right down here, that first one for vector representation of line and space, this is the most similar to the y equals mxb notation that we have there. Okay, so it's not how we're going to write our equation for a line, the two things below that are what we're going to actually try to end up with, but it kind of is a little connecting piece between the two of them. Again, we know y equals mx plus b. You guys know what that is, you know how to use it. It's something you've used for a long time. So just trying to link it to what we're doing now. So L is going to represent our equation for a line. Um, right now, we have component form for a vector, okay? And this is basically telling us the point that it's going to go through. So this is a vector right here. This is a point right over here, so it's not just P there, but it's that same idea. We know that if we're going off to some point P, we can find a vector for that component form from 0, 0, 0 to whatever this point P is. We're going to get this vector, x1, y1, z1. So we have some kind of vector we're working with here. And then we're introducing a new variable. Okay, so we haven't had t in this system here yet. Okay, so t is going to be our independent variable. And so the idea kind of is this. Think about v, this little expression we have over here. Okay, if t is an independent variable, it's just going to be a number. It's going to be some kind of scalar, but we're going to allow it to have any possible value here. But it's essentially a scalar. What does v represent based on this little vector. second? Some kind of vector. And we know what happens if you take a vector times a scalar. Yeah, stretches are compressed if it's negative flipping in the other direction here. So really, all this second part here is doing is say, okay, vector v is your direction. This is where you want the line to go. But a vector is limited in how long it is and um, the direction it points in. So if you have just vector v goes here, you know your line's going to go a lot longer than that. And so what t is basically doing is say, okay, well, here's your direction. We know we can make it longer. We know we can make it shorter. We know we can flip this direction and go the other way there, but we're going to stick along that same path that we're traveling on. So that's really all this part is doing. It's saying, okay, your direction, your slope is this vector v. We're going to stretch it or shrink it to be able to cover any possible value here. And what the other part, the plus that vector is doing is it's forcing it to go to that specific point. Okay. So we're not really going to use that notation too much, even though it's very similar to y equals mx plus v. Um, we're going to use that and then basically expand that to get what's below it here. So I didn't really leave any work to do it, but you guys can kind of reason through it here. If I said go through and actually expand this, what you would have, since vector v is this vector a, b, and c, t is going to get multiplied by a, b is going to multiply by, or uh, yeah, t is going to multiply by b, and c is going to multiply by t. So if we distribute that t, v, we get those little parts there. And then we're going to go through and just add vectors together. So x component plus x component y plus y. So I didn't leave room. If we need to do it off the side, we can. But maybe you can kind of see where that comes from. If you imagine just expanding this, 
you're going to end up with this over here. This is probably the most common way we are going to represent lines. Okay, we're going to use this parametric form to represent the equation of a line here. How many equations do we actually write here? How many pieces do we have? Is it just one equation? Technically. Well, kind of is. It's one like graph, but how many little parts of this equation do we have? Three. Okay, we have to have those. Remember when you were working at parametric equations in Calc 2, is it was kind of like you had your regular x, y, and you talked about parameterizing it with your calculator, and then you mentioned it into polar coordinates, yeah. right? And this is kind of the same thing there is we are going to kind of pause at that parametric piece here and say, okay, if I want to write the equation for a line with 3D space, this is the most common way to go through and do it. A reason why it can't really get simpler, how many dimensions is a line? How, well, it's like a, a two-dimensional shape, right? Mm -hmm. It goes just kind of this way. Point will be one, a line will be two dimensions, and then once you add more, kind of there from there. Well, it's actually one-dimensional shape, but it fits in a two-dimensional graph well, so I'm thinking there. But anyway, a line fits nicely on a two-dimensional plane. Okay. Once you put it in a three-dimensional space, there's a lot more options for it to happen here, and we can't just easily describe it like we did before. There's really no simpler way to work in a line than parametric equations. Uh, we'll talk about symmetric equations in just a minute. We're not going to use this very often. I think this is an easier way of working with it. But that's going to be kind of our, our goal when we're asked to write a set of equations for a line. We're always going to put these parametric equations here. Okay? So we'll work through some examples in a minute, uh, but that's kind of our goal here. The symmetric equations are pretty much just taking all of these and solving them for t. So if you imagine taking that first equation for x, and solving it for t. So for example, we want to do this for all of them because it's the same process. So we can subtract x1 from both sides. And then we can divide through by a. Okay. And that's where these things come from. So if you want to stick a t equals in front of all this, go for it. Okay. It's just an alternative way to write this. You're still stuck with three separate parts. Um, this doesn't get used quite as much as a parametric form, but just know if you ask for symmetric equations, this is what it's looking for. Okay, but the parametric equations are really what we're going to work with the most. So we need a point, we need a direction or a slope, and then we're going to go back and plug all these parts. So let's do an example. Find a set of parametric equations and symmetric equations of the line L that passes through these two points here or this point is parallel to something else there. So like we said, in 3D, the two things that we have to have for a line, we need to know a point, and we need to know a direction. Okay. And just picture what we have here. I'm not going to go through and graph this one. I'll graph one later on. But we've got some point floating in space. This point 2, 4, negative 1. And what we want to do is we want to say, okay, I'm going to draw a line through this point. Well, there's an infinite amount of lines, just like with two-dimensional space, but not only can we go kind of around it, but we can rotate in any direction. That's more like this gyroscopic infinite amount of things there. So that's where the direction comes in handy. Um, and we are, in this problem, told the direction. We are told that we want this line to go in the same direction as this vector. Now, if you think about just graphing these two as is, this point two, four, one, and this vector and component form, they probably don't line up. Okay, we have a point floating somewhere in space. We have a vector starting at the origin. They're not going to go through each other. And I lied. I am going to go through and graph this. Um, let's see. All right. So what were the points I had there? What was point P in that problem? Point P is uh, two, four, two, negative four, negative one. one. And what was the vector? Okay, so there is a stuff there. So if we look at this, um, that vector does not go close to A. Okay? It is not going through that point there. But remember that we have the ability to take these vectors and kind of slide them around there. So all that vector B is doing is saying, this is the direction I want it to go. Okay, so we're saying, be parallel to this. Okay. It might not pass through that specific black vector that we have drawn there, but if I were to, and I can't really just click and drag this one, but if you imagine clicking and dragging this vector so that it started at that point A, then it would be on my line there. But they're still equivalent. Component form is just an easier way to work with this. So don't get stuck thinking, well, this point and this vector don't go through each other. How am I going to draw a line? 
that vector is just telling us the direction we want the line to go. Okay, we're going to force it to go to that point by adding that point onto it later on. Oops, place too much. So, we say go through it, can it start at the point? Um, yeah, it can start at the point. Remember, lines are infinite in both directions. Right. Okay. I'm, but yeah, I'm, if you want to imagine it starting at that point, that's fine. I know because it, I'm, it's saying go through it. I know if you start at it, it's certainly going through it. Yeah, I think that would still be considered going through it. Because when we take that vector v and multiply it by t, like we're going to do in just a minute, we're going to take this vector. Let me see if I can think of a way to make this happen. I'm sure I can. So let's say we're going to start at that point, and we are going to go to the next point. So that would mean 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 4 is 7, 2 plus negative 1 is 1. Let's see if I thought about that. There we go. Okay, so I went ahead and shifted that vector. So that black vector and that gray vector now are parallel, right? Right. And so they're equivalent vectors, but now we can kind of see more what's happening here. So that's kind of good. Even if we start at that point, like you're saying, what we need to do now is we need to take this new vector we have over here, and we need to make this thing go on in both directions here. Okay. And so that's the idea of multiplying it by t. We're saying, well, we don't know how long it's going to go. Lines go on forever. So we don't want to just multiply it by like 2 or negative 1 or something. We're going to give the option to be any possible scalar of this guy over here. So that's what we're going to look for. That's how we're going to write these equations. Um, but we have everything we need for this one. We don't need to do any setup work. Okay, you didn't even need to go through and graph it. If it kind of makes sense what to do, then you should be good to go here. So even though our goal is to get that parametric equation, I like to kind of think about this, especially in the beginning. We're going to take that, let's write this sloppy. We're going to take that point and kind of think of it as a vector, okay, that we're working with. And we're going to go through and say, okay, well, t times the actual vector that we're dealing with. And that T is going to allow us to stretch or shrink that direction. But if you do this, okay, the, now again, 2, 4, negative 1 is given to us as a point. But we know that I can make that into a vector if I just have an initial starting point of 0, 0, 0, go back to like point form. It just makes the math look out nicer here. Um, T is just going to hang around. And we know vector V is 1, 3, 2. We were told that. And we could skip this step and just use the parameter equations, but again, I want to kind of show where those things come from here. So this, like I said, it's the closest thing we have to slope intercept form. I think about um, y being your L, m being that 1, 3, 2 vector times x plus your point. It kind of matches up what we did. For your point, huh? two things. One, why are we writing point and point for you? Because we can't technically add a point and a vector. We can add a vector and a vector. So instead of thinking about this as just a point here, right, so if we have this is the point we're ending at and think about the original point or the starting point. No, but if we're doing, if we're adding a point or a vector and a vector, these two vectors are going to be totally opposite directions. I see what you're saying. Should we go ahead and explain this? So yes, typically, okay. So the vector we're adding to it, this t times whatever vector. Mm -hmm. The stronger vector. Well, you can think about it that way. But it's like, we don't really know where this vector ends. It's just going to be super long here. So basically what we're doing, OK, I, it makes sense in my head. I don't know if I can explain it out loud here. When we have, let's just go to just this point here. So we've got this point A, right? And what I'm saying is, well, let's pretend that this is now actually a vector. Mm -hmm. OK. What this does that gives me a set of directions, it says, OK, well, starting at the beginning, at the origin, we're going to do this. We're going to go in this direction here. OK. Well, once we're at that point A, we really don't care about where we started with. We're just, we're here now. And so we're going to do the next set of directions, the next vector, which that's, could be this one. So if we're just doing by a scalar of 1, we're going to go this distance. But if we were going to go through and do this by a scalar of like 2, I don't know if this is going to work. OK, up oh, too far. Okay. But if we think about that first vector, it's kind of telling me just where I'm going to go to start with. And then once I'm there, there's no backtracking on this one. We're going to okay, say, do this first vector, go to this point, essentially, do this first vector. And then from there, we are going to travel along this other path here. So we're not so much interested in the fact that we started off at the origin, now we're over here, which is right. typically what happens when we add vectors. Right. It's kind of like the end result there. We just not know like where we end. 
So the fact that we could have gone this way to get there faster really doesn't matter. We knew that we had to start here at A, and then we're going to do something else from there. Okay. Maybe. Uh, I mean, I see what you're saying. Just I don't know why, in this case, of it adding that we aren't caring about that. Because the goal is to have that line. The goal is to say, okay, once you go to this point, and I tell you how far to go, either this way or this one line there, where are you ending up is what we care about. Like, where is this line you can possibly travel on? We don't really even care about where you end up. Like if you're at this point on the line or this point on the line, you can stay still. We don't care. We just want to know in this situation, like where could you go if you start from this point? Okay. So, so it's like answering a different thing. When we add vectors, the goal is like, where do you end up? If you add a vector, you do this, you do this, well, where do you end up? Basically what this is saying is start from here, where could you go? Right. So, but when we add two vectors together, what's the answer? It's just telling you where you could go because when we're working with these vectors here, one of these vectors at t times whatever, we don't want really to know where it ends. It's multiplying by t is saying, okay, well, it can end anywhere. It's a whole bunch of different places it can end there. So we don't really know where we yes. end because so we don't know what T is. So it's not form is what I'm saying. Correct. It is not going to be that's conforming form. That's yes. what I'm trying to get at. So yes. when we add them together, we can't put them in form because that would be that line. We kind of could. We'll, we'll do it in just a minute here. Let's, let's do this. Okay. So kind of answering the first part of your question, seeing where you're going with that. Right now we've got this point we're going to start at, 2, 4, 1. Think about it as a vector to get us there. And then we're going to go through and do a whole bunch of multiplication adding here. So let's keep that first vector as is for now. And if we just distribute that t, we're going to have t times 1, so just t, uh, 3t, 2t. Because t's just a scalar, so we can multiply by it. And then if we're adding vectors, this kind of question that Russell's been asking about there, we're just going to combine the parts together. And so we will keep it in component form for just a minute here. We're going to have 2 plus t, should be a comma there. Uh, 4 plus 3t, and negative 1 plus 2t. Okay. You could leave that as the equation for your line. If you left that as that vector, that's not wrong. It's just typically we write them in parametric equations. But you could leave it in this component form, and that would describe a line right there. That's not the line that's parallel, that's parallel to the direction. It is. That's straight across. No, it's still parallel to that direction, because we force ourselves to go to that starting point, 2, 4, negative 1. So we said from this point, we are only going to add multiples of this parallel vector. So it's like think about doing slope intercept form. You do your intercept first, right? You go up whatever. Right. And if your slope is like one half, you go up one over two. Right. Could you up one over two again? Yeah. Could you do it again? Yeah. Could you go the other way? Down one over two? Yeah. That's basically what's happening here. We're saying, okay, instead of up one over two, we are doing this vector one, three, two. We're going one x, three y and 2 in the z direction. And then what that t basis says is, okay, well, do it a second time. If t equals 2, you're going to do it again. If t equals 3, you're going to go through and do it again. But you're starting from that point that the first vector told us to get to of 2, 4, and negative 1. Okay. I mean, I'm, I might just have to see your number. Okay. In my eyes, I might have to see <laughs> Okay. All right. And still, I mean, it makes sense. Are we adding vectors down? We're still going to get that vector, and we're still got this line. What we don't care about that line anymore. Yeah, that's sure. not what we care about. I know that's not what we care about, but when we add them together, that's what we're going to find. Yeah. If you yeah. knew what t was, if I said, okay, here's this general set of directions, mm -hmm. let's let t equal 7, then we will get a point, and then we would care about the component form that we end at. We would care about that line that connects the two of them. Okay, so why are we in Because right now we don't care about where we end. We just want to know where could you go. Gotcha. So it's like you get on this road, what does it lead to? We don't care where you end, but just what could you go to? I got you. Okay. So it's just answering different types of things here. Okay. So, You're gonna keep me thinking all semester, and that's okay. So all right. Um oh yeah, is there another question? Um is T the value that moves that initial vector B over to point A? Sort of. So the initial vector P isn't gonna change. So we're gonna do this first vector. And there's no t on this. That doesn't change. What t does is tells us like how many times we're going to do the slope. How many times are we going to do that other vector p? Okay. But the p never going to change. So like I was telling Russell, you do your slope intercept form. You go to your y-intercept, and that doesn't change. That is the y-intercept. You can't move it. Okay. You can go different distances from it, but you can't move that y-intercept. And that's kind of what's happening here. P, it's not a y-intercept, but it's that fixed point that we're working with. So we're not going to change that. We're always going to do that that one time, 
but then T is telling us how many times we're going to do that direct to the vector. Okay. All right, so we're not really done with this one. You need to write it one more way. So this is an okay way to write it, but what we really care about usually is the parametric equations, which we basically have here. We know that that t plus 2 is the x component, so x equals t plus 2, or 2 plus t I wrote. Uh, the middle is the y component, and then the last is the z component. And when it asks for a parametric form for a set of vectors, that's what it's looking for. You know what? Let's not even worry about the symmetric ones. Okay, not something we're going to really use, so let's just pause there and rather you guys understand what we actually use and just go cap. Okay. See, that makes sense. Really. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> That's I mean, usually what we want. Because, yeah, it's looking at it like yeah. that. Because usually we think a component form is taking you somewhere, the vector takes you somewhere, but this is like a, an open ended component form. It right. doesn't really have an end there. Okay. All right. So, to make things even more fun, this is not the only way we could write the equation for this line. <laughs> I don't know if that was relevant to this or your own thing, but it was appropriate. Okay. Um, there's lots of ways we can write the equations for a line here. And let's just think about it this way. Okay, let's go back to the same example. So, say we've got this point 2, 4, negative 1, and we've got this direction vector 1, 3, 2. The direction vector just tells us which way we want to be parallel to, right? What is a vector parallel to this direction vector? Just give me any vector parallel to this guy. Four, eight, maybe two. Four. Where'd you come up with that? Just multiply them into two. Okay, multiply, multiply direction B by two, not P by two. Um, B by two, um, yeah. two, six, four. Okay, so two, six, four is parallel to one, three, two, right? And so that B vector, one, two, that's our direction vector. That's kind of what we're trying to follow along here. It's the vector we want to be parallel to. We really don't care if it's this big and we're parallel, if it's this big and we're parallel, or if it goes in this direction or parallel. As long as we're parallel to it, we're happy with it. If we were to go through and follow the rest of that process with this red vector instead, we're going to get different equations here. But it's going to still across the same line. Okay, so there's lots of possible answers for working with parametric equations of lines, but not just one answer. Anytime you work with parametrizing, that happens though. Okay, so if you do remember back to doing this stuff in Calc 2, there's multiple ways you can parameterize an equation, not just one way to do it, and the same thing happens here. Okay. Um, there's other ways you can vary it, but we won't over that for now. So, I'll try to summarize some of this down here. The pen is really laggy today. So, is this set of parametric equations unique? The answer is no. I want to say any vector parallel to B. would give the same line so what if there's no parallel to b there will always be something parallel to b unless it's just a zero vector if it is a zero vector then we've got other problems to deal with besides just finding parallel lines there so any vector we have b we can always find something parallel to by multiplying by any number so right. we'll always be able to find a parallel vector all right any vector parallel to B would give the same line, but a different set of parametric equations. Okay. As far as the symmetric equations go, like I said, let's not worry about those too much right now. If the homework asks about them, because I read about published, I'm not going to try to go back and edit it. Um, but if the homework asks about your parametric your symmetric equations, just I'll talk about it in class. Bring up the class and we'll talk about it then. They're not difficult, it's just we don't really ever use them, so we won't already talk about them today. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's do a more general example. Because in that last one, we were given everything we needed. Okay, we were told the point, we were told the direction vector. We could have avoided all of our discussion and just done the math and called it good there. Um, but we're not always given that same information. So let's do an example where we have different information that we're given. Okay, and we'll just stick with finding the parametric equations. So the x equals something, y equals something, t equals something. So find a set of parametric equations to a line that passes through, and we're just given two points. In two dimensional space, is two points enough to find the equation of a line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll be in three dimensions also. Okay, we just need to kind of find different information there. So let's look at graphs of this one, which I think I already have this one right across. I shouldn't close that. 
Are those the points in this one, or is this the next example? Negative two, one, zero. Oh, dang it, I didn't get it right. Okay. The next example, right then. Okay, so give me the points then. Oh. Uh, negative two, one, zero. And one, two. All right, so there's actually points. Let me get rid of that gray plane. Okay, and we want to find the equation of a line that goes to these points. Can you visualize that there is a line that goes to those points there? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's really easy to drag where I want. All right, so now the goal is to say, okay, well now what is that equation for a line? What do we need to write the equation for a line in 3D? We need two things. We need a point and we need direction. Well, we're told two different points here. Doesn't matter which one we pick. We've got options for the points there, but we're not given a direction vector. So how are we going to find the direction vector? Um, can we pretend there's a component form and then add them together? Or subtract them? Well, they're going to give us two different things. One of your answers is right, one of them is wrong. We're going to find the component form between these two vectors here. Because if we want to make sure that our line goes between A and B, whether from A to B or B to A, it doesn't matter. If we want to make sure it goes between these two vectors, we need to know what direction do we have to go in to get from one point to the next. So we need the component form for one of these is initial, one is a terminal. Really doesn't matter which one is which. Again, kind of giving us more options for what a parameter can look like. But well, we basically are going to find the difference between these two points. That's where we're going to form. Okay, so again, let's look at what we need. We need two things. We need a point and a direction. Okay, for the point, you can choose either one. It really doesn't matter. Do you guys have a preference? Which point do you want to work with? First one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you do the second one, then we'll compare it, which is fine with me. Okay, so pick the first point, or you can use the other one, it really doesn't matter. They're both going to be online at some point there. And then again, for our direction vector, it really doesn't matter what we call the terminal or initial, or initial minus terminal, because we're just getting a direction. So if we're going to go this way, or we're going to go backwards, we're still going to be parallel to that line there. So let's just go ahead and say, like, this is our um, uh, terminal point. We'll say this is our initial point. So the vector that we're going to be working with is going to be negative 2 minus 1, 1 minus 3, and 0 minus 5. So let's add that vector to this graph. Negative 3, negative 2, negative 5. Okay. And again, does that vector go through our points right now? No. No, why not? I mean, we just did it so it would. Why doesn't it look like it is on the graph? Oh, right. Component form is always going to take that vector and scoot it to the origin. Okay. If we wanted to make sure it started and stopped at those points, um, we went from B to A. Okay, that vector there is the same thing. It's equivalent to our component form for the vector. You'll see when it simplifies it down, it gives us the same things, but it's just not the component form anymore. Okay, so we're still talking about the same thing. We're working with the right vector there. But again, I did that V is just something parallel to it. We're going to pass our point, which is going to be parallel to that thing there. So now we're at the same position as before. We've got a point, we've got a vector. We can go through, we can find component for um, parametric equations. You are more than welcome to go through and do it this way over here, but since we kind of can see what we're looking for there, let's just jump to this, to x equals whatever, y equals whatever, z equals whatever there. So the x1, y1, z1, that just comes from the point that we picked, and the a, b, and c come from the vector that we found for direction, and just multiply them all by t. So again, if you'd rather do it the way we did the last one, that is a okay, but really since we want to know that component form, I'm sorry, that parametric form, we're just going to pull this. So we're going to have point plus vector times t, point plus vector times t, point plus vector times t, which I can clean all those up and make them look a little nicer. I don't need to write adding negatives. All right, so negative 2 minus 3t, 1 minus 2t, and negative 5t. Okay, and that would be a set of parametric equations that pass through those points there. I'm not sure I know how to graph this on that thing, but let me check real quick and see if this works. 
It's not going to work. You can't just put equations in there. Well, since it's parametric, I don't have a graph parametric equation in the software. Oh, it did work. Okay, I just had to finish. So there we go. That was more expected. So there's the line that we actually made. So let's get rid of this vector. Okay, you can see that, yeah, it's parallel to this vector. Those guys are definitely parallel. Um, but there is a line that we're actually interested in. I just keep zooming out. Okay, that line just goes on forever and ever and ever. So just hope you multiply by two. So that's what we're looking for, is just that. Not so much where do we end up. We know it goes through both these points. We know it's parallel to this vector that we established in the beginning, and there is the line that, that satisfies all those conditions. Okay. Now that being said, like we just mentioned, is this the only way we can explain that line? Did you have to go through and use the other point? No. Um, I, I, okay. If we went through and used the other point, if we use the point one, three, five, would I get these same equations? No. No, because right now, these numbers here are coming from this point. If I would have picked the other point, 1, 3, 5, I would have 1 plus negative 3, T, 5, 3 plus, and I had different numbers here. It's still going to be the same line because we're still forcing to that point there. Okay? If I would have found my direction vector in the other order, if I would have said, okay, well, my terminal point is this guy and my initial point is this guy, then my vector would be the opposite. I'd have positive 3, positive 2, positive 5. Again, that can change my parametric equations, but they're all correct. So there's a lot of possible answers you can have here. Web of science, but A-OK -okay with however you enter your answer here. I'm fine with however you answer. So you're not looking for B, right, one that it likes there. Just know there's a lot of ways you can go through and represent these equations here. Okay. Or if you really want, like we said, you can stretch or shrink this vector B. You can multiply everything there by a factor of 10. Totally going to change your parameter equations, but it's still correct. Okay. So we've got a lot of options for what this can look like here. So is this only correct answer? No. We could have picked a different point. To plug into our equations, we could have found our direction vector in the opposite order to plug into our equations. There's a lot of different answers that we can get from this. I don't know why the pen today is not happening. Oh. Yeah, there's lots of other things you could have done. Questions? Lines are kind of messy just because it's like taking a shape with too few dimensions and sticking into 3D. So it's, it's a little sloppier. Planes actually I think are a little easier. Okay, which we'll start talking about now. All right, so planes in space. Um, in a two-dimensional system, we've never talked about planes because it is just one plane. You have the xy plane, and that's it. There's no other dimension to move this plane to. You might talk about shapes within that plane, but you have, sorry, okay. it's just shapes within planes, snakes, and planes. I keep thinking airplanes. It is. Take the pictures of there. All right, so in two-dimensional space, we have one plane, the xy plane, and that's it. How many planes do we have in 3D? An infinite number. I mean, we can take these planes and put them anywhere. Um, so we have an infinite number of planes in three-dimensional space. If we talk about kind of those special coordinate planes, we'll call them. How many coordinate planes do you think we have? Three. Yeah, we have three. We're going to have um, the xy coordinate plane, which is where the x-axis and the y-axis kind of intersect in what they make. We're going to have the yz coordinate plane and the xz coordinate plane. Um, and these two planes basically split up our space. We talked about having octants in 3D space and having um, the similarities. That, that's really what these guys are doing here. Okay. So now the question is, okay, well, how do we represent a plane in the equation? Okay, so we're going to use vectors. We're going to use the three stuff to be able to represent a plane here. Uh, I have an explanation of it right there, but let's, before we even get to this part, because we'll kind of go through and prove it. Um, in our regular 2D space, what's like the simplest shape we can have? A square, uh, even more simple than that, less sides. 
much as like a line, like an equation. Okay, lines are like super simple, especially like horizontal or vertical lines, right? But a line is very simple. There's not a lot of stuff to it. Um, and when we're working with our three-dimensional space, planes basically take that same role. Okay, planes are going to be like that super simple shape. There's no curves, there's no bends, there's no boundaries. It's just a flat plane there. So if you think about your equation for a line, it's a linear equation, right? What does it mean to be a linear equation? Besides that, a graph makes a line, which is definition. It has a constant slope, okay? And there's no radicals, no dividing by variables, none of that stuff that makes rationals or science good like that. So a constant slope, that's the only change that we see here. So when we're working with planes in 3D space, we're going to see something very similar. We're not going to have squares, we're not going to have square roots, we're not going to be dividing by variables or no trig functions. It's just going to be basically a bunch of little linear terms. We're going to have linear effect on X, linear effect on Y, linear effect on Z, and that's going to be it there. Okay? So the equation we're going to get to in just a little bit is pretty simple. This middle part here does kind of use vectors, but eventually the equation we end up with is a pretty simple equation to work with. Um, so I say we can use standard equation or general equation. Don't even worry about that right now. Okay? What we're going to need in order to write the equation for a plane is we need a plane. Okay, we need to know, well, where is this plane? Much like a line. We can have an infinite amount of these guys. We need a point that tells us kind of where this thing exists. So let's go ahead and call that point P. And point P is fixed. Okay, we're not going to move this thing around. We've got some point P, and it is fixed in space. Okay, it is on our plane, fixed in space. The other thing we're going to work with, though, is a vector that um, is perpendicular to our plane. So let's first create one more point here. I should add this. Let's add one more point here. Let's say it's Q. And let's just call this um, x, y, z with no subscripts. This is going to be a movable point. So if we think about this point P is fixed, this point Q can move around. It can go a whole bunch of different places. But let's force it to still stay in that plane. So both these guys are in the plane we're interested in finding. P is fixed. Q can kind of move around all over the place. And then what we're going to do is now we have this normal or perpendicular vector. If we have a normal vector, that means it's perpendicular. They're just synonyms there, much like orthogonal, perpendicular, normal, perpendicular. Okay, we're going to have some other vector that is perpendicular to this movable vector PQ. Okay, so try to imagine if you're on the table and you have a point fixed and you've got like your pen that you can kind of rotate around. The point that's not moving is P. The tip that's moving around is Q. And if we draw something perpendicular to that table, this is going to be the normal vector that we care about here. So let's just say this is vector n. We know it has to be perpendicular to this. If Q moves somewhere else, and it's still perpendicular to it. If Q moves somewhere else, and it's still perpendicular to it. Okay. So I'm not going to try to draw the plane here because I think I'll just make it look sloppy. But does that kind of make sense to set up we have right now? We have a few more things down here. So we this is listed up above. We're going to list it down here too. So Q is a movable point. P is a fixed point. They are both in the plane. And the other thing we're going to have is um, a little bit of space for this minute. We're going to have a normal vector. And this is perpendicular to the plane. And we'll see why we bother talking about something perpendicular to the plane in just a minute here. Find a vector for PQ. Okay, if Q is a terminal point and P is the initial point, when we go through and find this vector PQ, okay, like we've done before, terminal point minus initial point, we're going to have Q, or I'm sorry, x minus x1, y minus y1, and z minus z1. Okay, remember, x, y, and z can change. These points can move all over the place. But those p, x1, y1, and z values, those things are fixed. They're not going to move. So we basically have variable minus constant, variable minus constant, variable minus constant for that vector. Okay. So we have this setup. We've got fixed point p, movable point q kind of moving around the plane. We have some perpendicular vector to this. What do we know has to be true about two perpendicular vectors? Or orthogonal, let's use that fancy word. Yeah, if we have two vectors that are orthogonal, we know their dot product has to be zero. So let's use that. Okay, if these guys are orthogonal, that has to be true to them. Okay. Now find the dot product isn't super difficult, so let's plug in the component form for each of these vectors. Let's go through and find the dot product. And I don't think I ever gave component form for n, so let's just go ahead and call it ABC, kind of like we did last time. Okay, just some letters or letters, numbers, whatever. This is math class, I can say both things, right? All right, so let's find that dot product. So we're going to have x minus x1, y minus y1, z minus z1, dotted with a, b, c. 
and we know it has to equal zero. So how do we do that product? A little bit of review. What do we do with that product? Um, first, change, change the yep. So we're going to have x minus x1 times a plus y minus y1 times b plus z minus z1 times c all equals zero. x1 is number, y1's number, z1's number, they're all constants, they're all fixed. a, b, and c are all numbers, they're all constants, they're all fixed. The only things that are variables here are x, y, and z. Okay, x, y, and z are this movable point Q, they're going to be things that are allowed to change there. Okay. So if we distribute all this and just make it look a little nicer, that's going to be where the equation for a plane comes from. But I'll pause here because this leads us directly to this thing right here. So there's your standard form for the equation of a plane. It is simply based on forcing that situation above to work out, which is not reasonable. I mean, it makes total sense to describe a plane that way. Um, and it works out so nicely with the dot plane. So that's that standard equation of a plane in space there. However, typically what we'd rather work with is a nicer looking thing that's messy. Parentheses always make things look nasty here. So let's go ahead and clean this up. So it's pretty much our uh, point slope from the. Uh, very similar. Very similar. Yeah. So let's distribute. We're going to have AX plus ax1 plus by plus by1 plus cz plus cz1 equals zero. Would it be ax minus one? Yep, minus if I could follow directions, we definitely have a lot of minuses in here. That means this should be minus two. And that should also be minus. I have no idea what I was thinking. I'm sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. We just mentioned this. What are the variables in this equation? A, B, and Z. Uh, a, B, and C are going to be numbers. We're going to know what they are. They're not going to be variables. Uh, X, y, Z. Yeah, X, Y, and Z. So the variables we're actually working with are X, Y, and Z. Let's isolate those on one side and scoot everything else the other side here. So A, X plus B, Y plus C, Z equals, if I add all the other terms over, we'll have A, X, 1 plus B, Y, 1 plus C, Z, 2. So the general equation for this is going to just look a little nicer. We're going to have AX plus BY plus CZ, and often we'll just write equals D. Okay. The fact that it's made of all these parts, sure, that's helpful, but this is the goal that we're aiming for there. So if we can write our equations from a plane to look like this, that's going to be the simplest, prettiest way to go back and write this. Okay. Now, we will go back and use this um, standard form to kind of get us started. It's easy to plug things in there. But then it's just distributing, but that's the goal. When we write an equation for a plane, this is our goal. Make it look like this. Okay. But again, that's a very nice, simple equation. Everything is linear. You have a number times x, constant times x, constant times y, constant times z. There is no differences in the rates of dimensions you're changing at. It's all just linear, which makes it nice and simple there. Okay. We'll do one example. We'll start one example, we'll probably finish up next time. All right, find the general equation of a plane containing these three points here. Okay. Um, I think this is the one I have graphed. I know one of them I had started graphing for us before class. Yay, finally this one. Okay, so there's A, there's B, and there is C. There is those three points for this problem here. Okay. Um, do these all lie on the same plane? Sure. Are three points enough to determine the equation of a plane? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about just like making a table. If you're trying to make a table, your plane is like your tabletop. If you've just got two legs, is your table going to be very good? No. No, your, your tabletop's going to flip all around there. If you add one more third leg, now you have three points it's going to rest on. Okay, so three points is sufficient to make a plane here. If we kind of try to angle this, okay, we can see that sure, they'll like they may be flat, they may line up there, but we need to know the equation for that plane. Right? That's what we're coming to. So much like when we write an equation for a line, we know some things we need here. When we write the equation for a plane, the two things we need to know is we need to know a point it has to pass through, and we need to know a normal vector. So we need to know, one more time. So normal vector is direction, right? Right. But direction not on the plane, direction perpendicular to the plane, which is kind of weird. But again, the reason for that, blame it on dot product. Okay. We have these three points that lie in a plane, and then we need to find a vector that is perpendicular to that plane. So it is a direction, but it's not the direction the plane is going in. It's the direction perpendicular to the plane. Okay. So we've got three options points. Whatever one you want to pick is going to work fine. Let's just say we pick the first one. 
how are we going to find a normal vector? We need a normal vector. And remember, normal means orthogonal. Uh, if the adult product equals zero. That is true, but we don't have a vector right now doing dot products with. So we We're going to need component form. And we've got some options here. So we can go A to B, B to C, B to A, whatever. It doesn't really matter. We're all on the plane. Pick your favorite direction to go travel in A to B. Okay, so we'll go A to B for one of them. Whoops, I keep minimizing both of them. I just said. So this is on the side here before we have to get to our orthogonal vector. Let's go A, B, and that's going to give us what? 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 4 minus 1 is 3, and 1 minus 1 is 0. And let's also say we'll go um, C to B. That doesn't really matter. Uh, so 0 minus negative 2 is positive 2. 4 minus 1 is 3. And 1 minus 4 is negative 3. Now think about those two vectors for a minute. We're not going to finish this up, so let's just talk real quick here. Tell me about these two vectors in the plane. Are these vectors in the plane we're looking for? No. no. Yeah, these vectors are in the plane that we're looking for here. I'm not going to try to drop them anywhere at a time. But if I connect any two of these points here, make that triangle, that triangle has to be in the plane that I'm talking about. So right now what we have is three points in the plane. We've got two vectors, but there's a whole bunch of different ones we could have set up there. We've got two vectors that are also in the plane. Uh, Monday, we will talk about what to do next because we are out of time there. But what we're looking for is vectors perpendicular, which we don't have just yet. And the dot product isn't actually what we're going to use to get there. So, so um, finish this up next time. Try to summarize it, go over it again. Um, this is not on the homework for this week, so just the stuff on cross and dot products. Is. All right, that is it. Have a good weekend and see you guys Monday.